In this video, Frank David, the founder of Pharmagellon and the author of a new book on how to analyze biotech clinical trials, uh, joins us to walk through how to quantify uh, your clinical trial probability of success estimates. This is a super important topic in biotech investing and it's also really, really hard, almost impossible to do uh, 100% right, but hopefully this video will give you a little bit of uh, some tips on how to better quantify your probability of success estimates for the next investment you make in biopharma. So one of the things that that people always ask about is what number to put into their model. Um, largely speaking, there are a couple of resources available. Certainly there are values in the literature. These are summarized from our forecasting evaluation book, but they're all public sources. Um, so one could pull them oneself. Um, certainly the, on the left, you see sort of the highest level kinds of numbers that get bandied about. On the right, uh, broken down by therapeutic area and sort of illustrating um, for me at least, illustrating that um, there's maybe less agreement on which are easier versus harder therapeutic areas than one might expect uh, on first principles. Um, but certainly you can find data to support being more pessimistic or optimistic about, um, about certain therapeutic areas. And then on the next slide, you, know, you can go even further and look within a therapeutic area and really look at on the left, um, you know, if these are different subtypes of cancer from, uh, from the Hay paper. And then on the right, uh, this was really looking at uh, by whether biologics, lead indication, et cetera, small molecule, large molecule. Um, you know, people do this all the time. I'd say they're good for, um, for a little bit of reality testing. I think they do suffer from sort of this, the law of small numbers problem. You know, certainly if there have only been four phase three studies in the last decade in pancreatic cancer, uh, I'm not sure how much it matters to know that it was 0% or 25% or 50% uh, of success out of those four programs. Um, but certainly it does, I think, help to level set a little bit, especially again, if you're comparing across that if you're looking at potential investments uh, that are very in very, very different therapeutic areas, it can help to level set a little bit um, using these types of numbers. You know, the other, um, I have not used Evaluate System, but they are now marketing a product that, uh, that essentially uses machine learning to try to do a little bit like what was on the right of that prior slide, really sort of extract the different characteristics of programs that might lead to a higher or lower probability of success. I worry a little bit that this is a precision versus accuracy problem. You know, you'll end up with something with a lot more, you know, that'll look a lot sexier and it'll have a lot more numbers after the decimal point, but I'm not sure that it's any more quote unquote right. Um, that having been said, um, you know, I think that the jury is still out and I, I think that it would be interesting to watch these types of things if you have access to them. To, uh, to sort of see what data come out and to the, what amount of validation ends up being uh, provided. And then, you know, equity research estimates are always somewhat problematic. Um, there's, uh, I would say in general, the, the view of most people who are professionals within drug development is that equity research estimates tend to over be, be over permissive on probability of success. You know, this example from aducanumab in the early days is uh, more extreme. Um, you know, claiming a 50% POS for an early stage Alzheimer's disease drug. Um, and I, you know, forgetting about what ended up happening, that was just a bad call. Um, and there's just no, it's, it's not plausible at all to, uh, to make that call. Um, so, you know, I think that using that, I, I personally do not find the POS estimates that helpful from equity research uh, work. I find other aspects of the equity research reports in terms of how they think about sizing the market and sort of the overall kind of what they, what they see as the key risks and the key issues um, and, and how they're conceptualizing the market, I think, are the, are the things that I get the most value from, from equity research reports rather than the POS numbers, which I think to a certain extent often are poorly validated and usually just chosen to justify an end number. Right. And I, I think if the equity research number, at least when I look at them, if, if the valuation they get or the price target they get is sort of in line with consensus and you look at a number of equity research reports and analyze the assumptions that they use and 
you know, if you find stuff that you can't quite wrap your head around, then maybe that can help you to clarify your thinking about, you know, what does the market actually believe about this particular variable? And do I believe something different enough to have a, a different conclusion? I think that's right. And I think, uh, again, seeing how different analysts think about sizing the market, sizing the population and sizing the market, I think can often be very instructive. You know, the really good analysts in our space, we're very fortunate, I think, in biopharma to have a lot of really smart equity analysts who are very sophisticated and go into the data and really show their work on many aspects of their valuation models. So you'll often get some really good discussions in equity research reports about how many patients actually are out there and how many of them are actually addressable by this drug if it were to be successful. And you'll get the references and then you can decide for yourself, um, you know, whether you agree with those or not, but at least you have some good, um, some good data to respond to. So that's a huge value of uh, equity research reports. Um, yeah, so I would say, again, when I think about this in front of the purpose of a model, you know, I, I, there's always a challenge about sort of to use one of these base case assumptions, like from the literature, which ones to use, again, how customized or not, can you customize based on the indication, should, and how much should you customize on the individual asset, how much of the value that you're, how much of the numbers that you're seeing, like, for example, if neurology has a lower phase three probability of success, how much of that is, is based on intrinsic scientific risk versus just bad, you know, bad things going through the pipeline, um, you know, those are, those are important things to wrestle with if you're going to be customizing from the base case. What are the reasons to make you think that you are better or worse than average um, is, uh, is worth considering. I think we already talked about the phase three and pancreatic cancer problem. Um, and again, to me, I think the idea, you know, what I have tried to do, and full disclosure, I don't do... I don't do the numerical POS piece as much as I used to anymore. Um, but I think in general, what I try to do is really just continue to add to my own kind of mental, mental number line of risk and try to, try to hang, hang examples on that like ornaments on a Christmas tree so that I can go back and I can say, okay, if I thought that this asset in phase two had a 60% probability of success for its phase two, and now I have this other thing, do, how, do I think, you know, how do I think it compares to this other thing that I gave 60% odds to? How do I think it compares to this other thing I gave 50% odds to? And to continue to refine, uh, to refine how I'm thinking about those to at least try to ensure some internal consistency. I think we're all going to have different views about how much weight we assign to these different components of clinical probability of success. Um, but, but within your own framework, you can, one can strive to be somewhat consistent. Right. And, you know, you always know model is in a vacuum. You have a goal for the model and you have other things you're comparing an investment of dollars to. So yeah, you don't have to always have a specific quantification of your probability of success. It's really just understanding where that risk relates to the other things that are available for you. And then obviously, you know, you don't put one number in and say, this is the number, this is right. You know, you've run sensitivities on that and see what happens under, you know, different scenarios and things like that to try to over understand the overall risk profile and how, how much of your bet relies on this one assumption that you may or may not have, have confidence in. Um, and that's right. I, I think that your approach of walking through all of these different areas of clinical risk and thinking rigorously through them is, is really important. And if you're someone who's just learning how to invest or you know work in the space, you may be allured by quantifying these numbers and you doing all this you know uh, sort of analysis to find a number that's the right number. But in reality, just understanding all of the components of risk at a very deep level is probably a lot more important than these sort of precise but not accurate uh, quantifications. Yeah, it doesn't help you build a model often, uh, or at least not uh, not directly. But I think it probably does help you get a kind of more of a gut sense of whether you think that it's an investable program or not. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think that that's all of the slides here. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to to walk through all this today. And I know this is a super complex topic, but a lot of it is kind of the essence of investing in biotech is understanding this clinical risk. And um, I definitely recommend people to pick up a copy of the book. Is, is this book out yet or? It is, it's on it Amazon. Is? Yes. Okay. And people, where can people find a link, a link to the description, but should people go to your, your Twitter or your website, where should they go to find out more about 
the book and in your other work? Um, so the book again is on Amazon and there's more about that book, our other book and some of the other things that we're working on, uh, on our website. We're hoping to roll out some teaching videos later this year. So, um, so if you want to stay updated, uh, you can sign up for our email list and we'll, uh, we'll send out a note periodically when those are up and running. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking the time to join, Frank. Always great to have expert opinions like this, uh, walking through a topic that a lot of people are really interested in. So really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. So that's it for this video and for the, the series of three videos that we did with Frank David. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. And uh, if you're interested in topics related to biotech investing, we try to put out a video every week or so. So subscribe to this channel to uh, stay updated when we post something new. Thanks.